Chapter Nine of Women in Love. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. Women in Love by D. H. Lawrence. Chapter Nine. Coal Dust. Going home from school in the afternoon, the Brangwen girls descended the hill between the picturesque cottages of Willie Green till they came to the railway crossing. There they found the gate shut, because the colliery train was rumbling nearer. They could hear the small locomotive panting hoarsely as it advanced with caution between the embankments. The one-legged man in the little signal hut by the road stared out from his security like a crab from a snail shell. Whilst the two girls waited, Gerald Cry trotted up on a red Arab mare. He rode well and softly, pleased with the delicate quivering of the creature between his knees. And he was very picturesque, at least in Gudrun's eyes, sitting soft and close on the slender red mare whose long tail flowed on the air. He saluted the two girls, and drew up at the crossing to wait for the gate, looking down the railway for the approaching train. In spite of her ironic smile at his picturesqueness, Gudrun liked to look at him. He was well set and easy. His face, with its warm tan, showed up his whitish, coarse moustache, and his blue eyes were full of sharp light as he watched the distance. The locomotive chuffed slowly between the banks, hidden. The mare did not like it. She began to wince away as if hurt by the unknown noise. But Gerald pulled her back and held her head to the gate. The sharp blasts of the chuffing engine broke with more and more force on her, the repeated sharp blows of unknown, terrifying noise struck through her till she was rocking with terror. She recoiled like a spring let go. But a glistening, half-smiling look came into Gerald's face. He brought her back again, inevitably. The noise was released. The little locomotive, with her clanking steel connecting rod, emerged on the high road, clanking sharply. The mare rebounded like a drop of water from hot iron. Ursula and Gudrun pressed back into the hedge in fear, but Gerald was heavy on the mare and forced her back. It seemed as if he sank into her magnetically, and could thrust her back against herself. "'The fool!' cried Ursula loudly. "'Why doesn't he ride away till it's gone by?' Gudrun was looking at him with black, dilated, spellbound eyes. But he sat glistening and obstinate, forcing the wheeling mare which spun and swerved like a wind, and yet could not get out of the grasp of his will, nor escape from the mad clamour of terror that resounded through her, as the trucks thumped slowly, heavily, horrifying, one after the other, one pursuing the other, over the rails of the crossing. The locomotive, as if wanting to see what could be done, put on the brakes, and back came the trucks rebounding on the iron buffers, striking like horrible cymbals, clashing nearer and nearer in frightful, strident concussions. The mare opened her mouth and rose slowly, as if lifted up on a wind of terror. Then suddenly her forefeet struck out as she convulsed herself utterly away from the horror. Back she went, and the two girls clung to each other, feeling she must fall backwards on top of him. But he leaned forward, his face shining with fixed amusement, and at last he brought her down, sank her down, and was bearing her back to the mark. But as strong as the pressure of his compulsion was the repulsion of her utter terror throwing her back away from the railway, so that she spun round and round on two legs, as if she were in the centre of some whirlwind. It made Gudrun faint with poignant dizziness, which seemed to penetrate to her heart. 
no no let her go let her go you fool you fool cried ursula at the top of her voice completely outside herself and gudrun hated her bitterly for being outside herself it was unendurable that ursula's voice was so powerful and naked a sharpened look came on gerald's face he bit himself down on the mare like a keen edge biting home, and forced her round. She roared as she breathed. Her nostrils were two wide, hot holes. Her mouth was apart, her eyes frenzied. It was a repulsive sight. But he held on her unrelaxed, with an almost mechanical relentlessness, keen as a sword pressing into her. Both man and horse were sweating with violence, yet he seemed calm as a ray of cold sunshine. Meanwhile the eternal trucks were rumbling on, very slowly, treading one after the other, one after the other, like a disgusting dream that has no end. The connecting chains were grinding and squeaking as the tension varied. The mare poured and struck away mechanically now, her terror fulfilled in her, for now the man encompassed her. Her paws were blind and pathetic as she beat the air. The man closed round her and brought her down, almost as if she were part of his own physique. "'And she's bleeding! She's bleeding!' cried Ursula, frantic with opposition and hatred of Gerald. She alone understood him perfectly, in pure opposition. Gudrun looked, and saw the trickles of blood on the sides of the mare, and she turned white. And then, on the very wound, the bright spurs came down, pressing relentlessly. The world reeled and passed into nothingness for Gudrun. She could not know any more. When she recovered, her soul was calm and cold, without feeling. The trucks were still rumbling by, and the man and the mare were still fighting, but she herself was cold and separate. She had no more feeling for them. She was quite hard and cold and indifferent. They could see the top of the hooded guard's van approaching. The sound of the trucks was diminishing. There was hope of relief from the intolerable noise. The heavy panting of the half-stunned mare sounded automatically. The man seemed to be relaxing confidently, his will bright and unstained. The guard's van came up and passed slowly the guard staring out in his transition on the spectacle in the road. And through the man in the closed wagon Gudrun could see the whole scene, spectacularly isolated and momentary, like a vision isolated in eternity. Lovely, grateful silence seemed to trail behind the receding train. How sweet the silence is! Ursula looked with hatred on the buffers of the diminishing wagon. The gatekeeper stood ready at the door of his hut to proceed to open the gate, but Gudrun sprang suddenly forward in front of the struggling horse, threw off the latch and flung the gates asunder, throwing one half to the keeper and running with the other half forwards. Gerald suddenly let go the horse and leapt forwards, almost on to Gudrun. She was not afraid. As he jerked aside the mare's head, Gudrun cried in a strange, high voice, like a gull or like a witch, screaming out from the side of the road, "'I should think you're proud!' The words were distinct and formed. The man, twisting aside on his dancing horse, looked at her in some surprise, some wondering interest. Then the mare's hoofs had danced three times on the drum-like sleepers of the crossing, 
and man and horse were bounding springily, unequally, up the road. The two girls watched them go. The gatekeeper hobbled thudding over the logs of the crossing with his wooden leg. He had fastened the gate. Then he also turned and called to the girls, "'A masterful young jockey that'll have his own road, if ever anybody would.' "'Yes!' cried Ursula, in her hot, overbearing voice. "'Why couldn't he take the horse away till the trucks had gone by? He's a fool and a bully. Does he think it's manly to torture a horse? It's a living thing. Why should he bully it and torture it?' There was a pause, then the gatekeeper shook his head and replied, "'Yes, it's as nice a little mare as you could set eyes on. Beautiful little thing, beautiful. Now, you couldn't see his father treat any animal like that, not you. They're as different as they welly can be, Gerald Cry and his father. Two different men, different maid.' Then there was a pause. "'But why does he do it?' cried Ursula. Why does he? Does he think he's grand when he's bullied a sensitive creature ten times as sensitive as himself? Again there was a cautious pause. Then again the man shook his head, as if he would say nothing, but would think the more. I expect he's got to train the mare to stand to anything, he replied. A purebred hayrab, not the sort of breeders as used to round here different sort from our sort altogether. They say as he got her from Constantinople. "'He would,' said Ursula. "'He'd better have left her to the Turks. I'm sure they would have had more decency towards her.' The man went in to drink his can of tea. The girls went on down the lane that was deep in soft black dust. Gudrun was as if numbed in her mind by the sense of indomitable soft weight of the man, bearing down into the living body of the horse. The strong, indomitable thighs of the blond man, clenching the palpitating body of the mare into pure control. A sort of soft, white, magnetic domination from the loins and thighs and calves enclosing and encompassing the mare heavily into unutterable subordination. Soft blood subordination. Terrible. On the left, as the girls walked silently, the coal-mine lifted its great mounds and its patterned headstocks. The black railway with the trucks at rest looked like a harbour just below, a large bay of railroad with anchored wagons. Near the second level crossing that went over many bright rails was a farm belonging to the collieries, and a great round globe of iron, a disused boiler, huge and rusty and perfectly round, stood silently in a paddock by the road. The hens were pecking round it, some chickens were balanced on the drinking trough, wagtails flew away in among trucks from the water. On the other side of the wide crossing, by the roadside, was a heap of pale grey stones for mending the roads, and a cart standing, and a middle-aged man with whiskers round his face was leaning on his shovel, talking to a young man in gaiters, who stood by the horse's head. Both men were facing the crossing. They saw the two girls appear, small, brilliant figures in the near distance, in the strong light of the late afternoon. Both wore light, gay summer dresses. Ursula had an orange-coloured knitted coat, Gudrun a pale yellow. Ursula wore canary yellow stockings, Gudrun bright rose. The figures of the two women seemed to glitter in progress over the wide bay of the railway crossing, white and orange and yellow and rose, glittering in motion across a hot world silted with coal dust. The two men stood quite still in the heat, watching. The elder was a short, hard-faced, energetic man of middle age, the younger a labourer of twenty-three or so. They stood in silence, 
watching the advance of the sisters. They watched whilst the girls drew near, and whilst they passed, and whilst they receded down the dusty road that had dwellings on one side and dusty young corn on the other. Then the elder man, with the whiskers round his face, said in a prurient manner to the young man, "'What price that, eh? She'll do, won't she?' "'Which?' asked the young man, eagerly, with a laugh. Uh, "'With the red stockings, what do you say? I'd give my week's wages for five minutes. What? Just for five minutes?' Again the young man laughed. "'Your missus would have something to say to you.' he replied. Gudrun had turned round and looked at the two men. They were to her sinister creatures, standing watching after her by the heap of pale grey slag. She loathed the man with whiskers round his face. "'You're first class, you are,' the man said to her, and to the distance. "'Do you think it would be worth a week's wages?' said the younger man, musing. "'Do I? I'd put them bloody well down this second. The younger man looked after Gudrun and Ursula objectively, as if he wished to calculate what there might be that was worth his week's wages. He shook his head with fatal misgiving. "'No,' nah, he said, "'it's not worth that to me.' "'Isn't?' said the old man. "'By God, if it isn't to me!' And he went on shovelling his stones. The girls descended between the houses with slate roofs and blackish brick walls. The heavy gold glamour of approaching sunset lay over all the colliery district, and the ugliness overlaid with beauty was like an narcotic to the senses. On the roads, Silted with black dust, the rich light fell more warmly, more heavily. Over all the amorphous squalor a kind of magic was cast from the glowing close of day. "'It has a foul kind of beauty, this place,' said Gudrun, evidently suffering from fascination. "'Can't you feel in some way a thick, hot attraction in it? I can.' and it quite stupefies me. They were passing between blocks of miners' dwellings. In the backyards of several dwellings a miner could be seen washing himself in the open on this hot evening, naked down to the loins, his great trousers of moleskin slipping almost away. Miners already cleaned were sitting on their heels with their backs near the walls, talking and silent in pure physical well-being, tired and taking physical rest. Their voices sounded out with strong intonation, and the broad dialect was curiously caressing to the blood. It seemed to envelop Gudrun in a labourer's caress. There was in the whole atmosphere a resonance of physical men, a glamorous thickness of labour and maleness surcharged in the air but it was universal in the district, and therefore unnoticed by the inhabitants. To Gudrun, however, it was potent and half-repulsive. She could never tell why Beldover was so utterly different from London and the South, why one's whole feelings were different, why one seemed to live in another sphere. Now she realised that this was the world of powerful underworld men, who spent most of their time in the darkness. In their voices she could hear the voluptuous resonance of darkness, the strong, dangerous underworld, mindless, inhuman. They sounded also like strange machines, heavy, oiled. The voluptuousness was like that of machinery, cold and iron. It was the same every evening when she came home. She seemed to move through a wave of disruptive force that was given off from the presence of thousands of vigorous, underworld, half-automatised colliers, 
and which went to the brain and the heart, awaking a fatal desire and a fatal callousness. There came over her a nostalgia for the place. She hated it. She knew how utterly cut off it was, how hideous and how sickeningly mindless. Sometimes she beat her wings like a new Daphne, turning not into a tree but a machine, and yet she was overcome by the nostalgia. She struggled to get more and more into accord with the atmosphere of the place. She craved to get her satisfaction of it. She felt herself drawn out at evening into the main street of the town, that was uncreated and ugly, and yet surcharged with this same potent atmosphere of intense, dark callousness. There were always miners about. They moved with their strange, distorted dignity, a certain beauty, and unnatural stillness in their bearing, a look of abstraction and half-resignation in their pale, often gaunt faces. They belonged to another world. They had a strange glamour. Their voices were full of an intolerable, deep resonance, like a machine's burring, a music more maddening than the sirens long ago. She found herself with the rest of the common women drawn out on Friday evenings to the little market. Friday was payday for the colliers, and Friday night was market night. Every woman was abroad, every man was out shopping with his wife, or gathering with his pals. The pavements were dark for miles around, with people coming in. The little market-place on the crown of the hill, and the main street of Beldover, were black with thickly crowded men and women. It was dark. The market-place was hot with kerosene flares which threw a ruddy light on the grave faces of the purchasing wives, and on the pale, abstract faces of the men. The air was full of the sound of criers and of people talking. Thick streams of people moved on the pavements towards the solid crowd of the market. The shops were blazing and packed with women. In the streets were men, mostly men, miners of all ages. Money was spent with almost lavish freedom. The carts that came could not pass through. They had to wait, the driver calling and shouting till the dense crowd would make way. Everywhere young fellows from the outlying districts were making conversation with the girls, standing in the road and at the corners. The doors of the public houses were open and full of light. Men passed in and out in a continual stream. Everywhere men were calling out to one another, or crossing to meet one another, or standing in little gangs and circles, discussing, endlessly discussing. The sense of talk, buzzing, jarring, half-secret, the endless mining and political wrangling, vibrated in the air like discordant machinery. And it was their voices which affected Gudrun almost to swooning. They aroused a strange nostalgic ache of desire, something almost demoniacal, never to be fulfilled. Like any other common girl of the district, Gudrun strolled up and down, up and down the length of the brilliant two hundred paces of the pavement nearest the market-place. She knew it was a vulgar thing to do. Her father and mother could not bear it. But the nostalgia came over her. She must be among the people. Sometimes she sat among the louts in the cinema, rakish-looking, unattractive louts they were. Yet she must be among them. And like any other common lass, she found her boy. It was an electrician, one of the electricians introduced according to Gerald's new scheme. He was an earnest, clever man, a scientist with a passion for sociology. He lived alone in a cottage in lodgings in Willy Green. He was a gentleman, and sufficiently well-to-do. His landlady spread the reports about him. He would have a large wooden tub in his bedroom. 
and every time he came in from work he would have pails and pails of water brought up to bathe in. Then he put on clean shirt and underclothing every day, and clean silk socks. Fastidious and exacting he was in these respects, but in every other way most ordinary and unassuming. Gudrun knew all these things. The Brangwen's house was one to which the gossip came naturally and inevitably. Palmer was, in the first place, a friend of Ursula's, but in his pale, elegant, serious face there showed the same nostalgia that Gudrun felt. He, too, must walk up and down the street on Friday evening. So he walked with Gudrun, and a friendship was struck up between them. But he was not in love with Gudrun. He really wanted Ursula, but for some strange reason nothing could happen between her and him. He liked to have Gudrun about, as a fellow mind, but that was all. And she had no real feeling for him. He was a scientist, he had to have a woman to back him, but he was really impersonal. He had the fineness of an elegant piece of machinery. He was too cold, too destructive to care really for women, too great an egoist. He was polarised by the men. Individually he detested and despised them. In the mass they fascinated him, as machinery fascinated him. They were a new sort of machinery to him, but incalculable. Incalculable. So Gudrun strolled the streets with Palmer, or went to the cinema with him and his long, pale, rather elegant face flickered as he made his sarcastic remarks. There they were, the two of them, two elegants, in one sense, in the other sense two units, absolutely adhering to the people, teeming with the distorted colliers. The same secret seemed to be working in the souls of all alike, Gudrun, Palmer, the rakish young bloods, the gaunt middle-aged men. All had a secret sense of power, and of inexpressible destructiveness, and of fatal half-heartedness. A sort of rottenness in the will. Sometimes Gudrun would start aside, see it all, see how she was sinking in. And then she was filled with a fury of contempt and anger. She felt she was sinking into one mass with the rest, all so close and intermingled and breathless. It was horrible. She stifled. She prepared for flight. Feverishly she flew to her work. But soon she let go. She started off into the country, the darkish, glamorous country. The spell was beginning to work again. End of chapter nine. Recording by Ruth Golding.